I was drinking my second cup of coffee, rubbing the stubble on my face and contemplating the unpleasant task ahead of me. My wife and I had just returned late last night from a trip to Yellowstone Park with another couple. When we finally pulled into the driveway, I only had enough energy to drag myself out of the van and into bed. Debbie had to go to work Monday morning, but I was able to sleep for a couple more hours. I didn't have to get off shift until 4 o'clock in the afternoon. My name is Dave Dawson, and my wife's name is Debbie. We were married just a year ago last month. The trip was kind of an anniversary present. Debbie had worked long enough to save up five days of vacation, so with the weekend off, we had nine days to drive around and see the sights. Plus, we were planning to start a family soon, and we didn't have another long vacation in sight. So we decided to make the trip while all the stars were still aligned. Our friends John and Kathy Harrison made the trip with us. The four of us were able to drive right through the park and right back, allowing us to spend a full seven days in the park. John and Katie had a 15-month-old baby boy, and Katie's mom just happened to be free this week to stay at their house and babysit. I walked out into the driveway and opened the side doors of my two-year-old custom-built Chevy van. If you can imagine how much junk four adults can accumulate in nine days of traveling, that's exactly what I saw. John and Kathy had managed to get most of their stuff out when we dropped them off last night. Looking at the mess, I sighed and started rummaging through my things. Our suitcases were still on the floor along with a box of food, a cooler, camping supplies, and a bunch of dirty clothes. The suitcases went back into the house. The dirty laundry went down the garbage chute. The contents of the fridge went back into the freezer. Food went back to the pantry. And camping and fishing gear went back to the garage. I looked at the bed I'd built in the back of the van and realized I might as well pull out the mattress and vacuum the entire floor. I got the vacuum and wastebasket out of the garage, opened the back doors, grabbed the bedding, and started pulling. The twin-size mattress was custom-made and fit snugly across the width of the van. It finally released noisily, and I fell on my ass as the mattress, bedding, and a flurry of miscellaneous debris came tumbling out at once. I got to my feet, separated the bedding, and set it aside to wash. I grabbed the wastebasket and started filling it with all the stuff that had spilled out with the mattress. McDonald's wrappers, beer can lids, rolled up napkins, crushed styrofoam coffee cups, condom wrappers. I stopped, staring dumbly at the last item. I sat up. My head was suddenly dizzy and I thought, how did this get here? I smoothed the torn wrapper over my knee. On the front it read Trojan Ultra Thin. Something was wrong. I knew it hadn't been there before we'd traveled to Yellowstone. I cleaned the van thoroughly, removing the mattress, vacuuming, and putting fresh linens down before we loaded into the car. I absent-mindedly went through the wrapping in my fingers, mulling over my options. Debbie had stopped taking the pill a month before. We decided to start a family as soon as she finished her first year of work. John and Kathy made no secret of the fact that she was on the pill until their son was two years old. Then they planned to get pregnant with a second. I wondered if it was a prank. John sometimes had a quirky sense of humor, especially after a few beers. For a few minutes, I pondered the possibility. Then I grabbed the wastebasket and dumped its contents on the walkway. I began rummaging through the trash, examining it carefully until I came across a bundle of rolled up tissue. I examined it thoughtfully, carefully pulling it apart. When the last layer of fabric peeled away, the unmistakable, unmistakable sight of dried, crumpled rubber bands was revealed. No, not a prank. Suddenly feeling nauseous, I sat up abruptly and put my head between my knees, trying to keep from throwing up. The logic was inescapable. One, someone was doing this in my van. Two, that someone wasn't me. Three, the only woman on this trip in danger of getting pregnant was Debbie. As I sat hunched over, I pondered the details of our trip. John and Kathy only slept in the van on the road. When we camped, they took a two-person tent with an air mattress and slept in it. Debbie and I slept in the van alone when we were at the park. The four of us spent most of the week together, hiking, swimming, or sightseeing. Together except for one day. About our fourth day in the park, I wanted to go to a small lake that was about five miles down the road. It had a waterfall and was rumored to have some good-sized fish. I decided to take my fishing rod and some lures and give it a try. Kathy was agreeable, but Debbie said she was tired and didn't want to go. John offered to stay with Debbie and go into town for groceries, which we were running low on. So after an early lunch, Kathy and I headed down the trail. It was over five hours later when Kathy and I returned to our campsite, tired but satisfied with our excursion. 
Debbie and John had cooked dinner on our little propane stove and were sitting around sipping beer. They had obviously had more than a couple drinks during the day, as evidenced by the bag full of empty bottles. They were sipping their beers and Debbie was giggling, laughing, and generally tipsy. I saw Kathy frown when she saw what was going on. John's drinking was sometimes a problem, and apparently they fought about it a lot. So far we had refrained, since John and Kathy had pitched their tent just a few feet away from us. And it was so warm that we slept with the van doors open except for the mosquito netting. The next morning John looked at me with a smug look, as if he recognized what we had done the night before. Now I realize that look was more like, you stupid shit, I just entertained your wife and you have no idea. And the sickening feeling I felt in my gut was telling me that I was starting to believe it too. As I cleaned up the inside of the van and then got the hose and started washing the outside, my thoughts went back three years to when Debbie and I met. I had just turned 20, and it was the second semester of my sophomore year at Northern Michigan University. I was an electrical engineering major, and I was doing okay academically, but money problems were wearing me down. I never qualified for a scholarship, so for the past two years I'd been paying my tuition out of the money I'd saved by working at high schools and auto plants for the past two summers. But the money was coming to an end. I knew I wouldn't be able to earn enough to go to junior high school this summer, and the part-time jobs during the school year were just enough for pocket change. Mom and Dad were never able to help me much either. We were Catholic, and I had three younger brothers and a sister at home. Our parents insisted that we all attend parochial school, at least through ninth grade. As a result, they were still paying tuition for the younger two. My older sister attended public high school as a senior. I had two choices. Start taking out student loans and graduate with an exorbitant financial burden, or drop out for two years and try to save enough money to graduate. I had already decided that a break wouldn't be unreasonable. The constant deadlines and exams are getting tiresome. Plus, I'm tired of living in a four-person room. No matter how hard you try, you always end up with at least one asshole roommate. I had already written a letter to the employment office at the assembly plant where I had worked the previous summer to inquire about a job. It was Friday night and exams had just ended. A few people from the dorm decided to sneak through a couple feet of snow to an off-campus party to celebrate. It was one of the typical fraternity beer parties. All the beer you can drink. Guys paid $5 each and girls got in for free. The music was loud, dancing in some rooms and playing drinking games in others. Before the night was over, a few guys got lucky and hooked up in one of the bedrooms upstairs. While I was in college, I dated girls periodically, but I hadn't had a steady girlfriend since high school. Although I wasn't a virgin, I lost that on prom night. I could count on the fingers of one hand with the remaining digits of the girls I'd been with. The engineering curriculum was tough and I was constantly moonlighting. I spent all my free time in the activity building playing basketball or sometimes racquetball. When we got home, one of my roommates, Josh, pointed to a group in the corner and I just nodded and said I'd get him a beer. I made my way through the groups of kids dancing or talking, trying not to spill the beer from the two plastic cups I got from the keg guy. Finally, I spotted Josh talking to a couple of girls at the far end of the hall. As I approached him, he reached over and took one of the cups and said, Dave, I'd like you to meet Miranda. We're in Economics 202 together. And this is her roommate, Debbie. And this is Dave. I smiled at Miranda, a pretty brunette, and extended my hand. Hi, Miranda. Nice to meet you. I then turned to her roommate, extended my hand, and froze. Standing in front of me was one of the most beautiful girls I had ever seen. She had long reddish blonde hair and green eyes that gave away her Irish ancestry, her smile lighting up the room. I eventually woke up to Josh, Miranda, and Debbie laughing at me. I blushed and apologized. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. I couldn't help myself. I looked Debbie straight in the eye and mouthed, but you're the most beautiful girl I've ever met. Now it was her turn to blush. Well, thanks, Ken. Girls can't hear that enough. And she laughed. Josh said, You know, you two are practically housemates. Debbie's from DeWitt. No kidding, I'm from Okemos. Did you go to DeWitt High School? No. I went to Gabriel Catholic High School, she said. Hey, I'm Catholic too, but my parents couldn't afford the tuition, said I. The two of us started talking and gradually secluded ourselves in one of the corners. Gabriel's school was a middle school that served about half a dozen parishes, including mine and Debbie's. Many of my friends from Catholic high school went there. It turned out she knew some of them, and we both graduated the same year. We talked and talked, completely oblivious to the time, 
until finally Miranda came up and said, I hate to separate you two, but it's past midnight and it's snowing again. We should get back to the dorm. Debbie looked at me with what I thought was regret and said, Well, I guess I should go. Trying not to sound desperate, I said, Wait, I'd like to meet you again. Can I call you? I smiled shyly. Okay, I'm at East Shaw Hall. Debbie, I don't even know your last name. Königsknecht. I know, that's a bit of a mouthful, she said a little embarrassed. I stared at her in amazement. You're a K-13. The first Königsknechts emigrated from Germany in the mid-1800s and settled in several mid-Michigan communities. Over the next hundred years, they were so prolific that their children dominated many rural schools. The story goes that one irate teacher eventually nicknamed them K-13 for the 13 letters in their name. And it stuck. Then she actually laughed. My bad. But my mom is Irish by blood. You wouldn't believe it. I have an uncle who married a K-13 from around Standish, said I. No kidding? Call me and we can talk some more. Miranda took her hand and pulled her toward the door. You betcha, I told her and watched them walk off into the night. The next day I called her back. I was so enamored with her that I couldn't wait. A day later we met for pizza. It was still a school night, but we spent hours together talking about school, friends from home, and our families. After high school, her parents wanted her to go to college closer to home. But she was tired of being under parental pressure. She applied to several colleges in the state and chose the one farthest from home. 400 miles proved to be enough distance to cut the tightest of ties. Debbie was studying marketing and had worked for the same retail chain for the past couple years. And on her upcoming vacation, she'd been hired as an intern in their business office. She was in college on a partial scholarship and student loans, so it was a priority for her to keep up her grades. She had two sisters, an older sister, and a younger sister. Her parents were still paying for the younger one's high school tuition, and the older one was attending a state college near Detroit. So they were very busy and could only provide limited help. She admitted that she was a cheerleader for the junior group in high school, but never tried out for the senior group. She loved the water and spent the last two summers of high school working as a lifeguard at the local country club. Apparently, her parents were pretty strict on her and her sisters. She said she wasn't allowed to go out much in high school. I later learned from Miranda through Josh that she was making up for lost time after going to college. Guys were lining up to go out with her. She went out once or twice a week, but she wasn't steady. I was determined to get closer to her. I asked her out again, and for the rest of the semester, we went out regularly. We always had a great time. She had a great personality and sense of humor. I could sit and listen to her for hours. She loved college parties. We'd have a couple beers each and do a little dancing. When the weather warmed up, I could see her in something other than boots and bulky sweatshirts. Damn how slender she was. Unlike her, I was just over six feet tall and weighed 190. I had brown hair, brown eyes, and correct but discreet facial features. I was in good shape thanks to regular exercise, but my appearance could best be described as stocky. I had a slightly swarthy complexion, but I didn't stand out in a crowd. We dated until the semester was over, about six weeks later, but the whole time I knew she was dating others as well. On our last date before the semester ended, we talked about meeting up when we got home. We lived only 20 miles apart, and she said she would love to keep dating me. But that was when I first told her of my decision not to return to college the following school year. When she realized what I meant, she seemed to pause and consider me carefully. It seemed to me that she accepted the idea and my reasoning. But later that night, instead of huddling up and sitting somewhere together, she announced that she needed to study for her final exam. Stopping our evening, I drove her back to her dorm. She gave me a quick kiss and hug and ran inside without saying a word about me calling her when we got home. Pensive, I walked back to the dormitory wondering what had happened. After my last exam and before I left campus, I tried to call her, but one of her roommates said she wasn't home. I knew her parents had come to pick her up and thought that maybe they had gone somewhere. Moving in with parents and siblings is never easy, but we seemed to get through it. And the day after I got home, I started working at the plant again. I was lucky enough to get a job as a quality controller on the day shift. At least for the first 90 days. After that, I would probably move to one of the other shifts. A couple times I tried to call Debbie in the evening at her mom and dad's house, but they always said she wasn't home. I left my number, but I got the feeling that she had blown me off. The thought made my heart break, but I suspected that if I continued to pursue her, it wouldn't end well. 
About a week later, I was surprised when my mom handed me the phone and said, This is someone named Debbie. When I answered, Debbie apologized for missing me the first couple of times I called and hoped I wasn't mad at her. I assured her that I wasn't. We talked a bit about final exams and our new jobs. Finally, she quietly said, Dave, I was hoping you'd call to ask me out. I was hoping, Debbie, but since I haven't been able to reach you the last couple weeks, I was under the impression that you didn't want to hear from me, I said sadly. No, no, Dave. Please don't think that way. I admit I was a little discouraged when you said you weren't going back to school. I didn't know what to think. But I'd like to go out with you again, she said. With that, a wonderful summer began. Since we both worked, we were able to see each other a couple times a week. And I was sure she wasn't seeing anyone else. Eventually, I got to know her family and she got to know mine. We all seemed to hit it off, except for my older sister. For some reason, she didn't seem to be happy with Debbie. But I just didn't pay attention to it. We went to movies, went out to dinner, sometimes had parties with her friends or my high school friends. We went to the beach on Lake Michigan a couple times when we managed to have a day off together. When I would see Debbie in a bikini, tears of joy would come to my eyes. We fooled around in the lake and she laughed at me when I pulled on my swim trunks and couldn't get out of the water. At the end of July, I decided I couldn't live at home for the two years it would take me to save enough money to go back to school. I was making a pretty good salary and figured I could afford a small apartment. But the most important reason was that I really wanted Debbie to be alone. I was pretty sure we were in agreement on where to go next in our relationship. Mom and Dad took the news favorably and helped me get some decent used furniture from friends and relatives. I moved in just a few weeks before Debbie was due to go back to school. That first weekend, we went out to dinner and came back to the apartment, both realizing what was about to happen. For the next three weeks, Debbie spent an evening with me every few days. One day, she told her parents she was spending the night with a friend and stayed over until morning. It was wonderful. I wanted to know everything about her. We chatted for hours on end. She told me how much she was enjoying college, the classes, the social aspects, and just the whole experience. According to her, her parents were still trying to control her social life. As the time for her to leave approached, I became more and more depressed. On the last night we spent together, we were talking. I said, Debbie, I know we've been avoiding talking about this, but since you're leaving tomorrow, I think we need to do it. I think I love you. And I don't want to stop seeing you. Debbie hung her head. I really like you, Dave. Maybe it's love. I don't know. But we've only been dating for a few months. And I don't want to stop seeing you. But we'll be 400 miles apart for most of the school year, and we'll both be busy. Trying not to sound desperate, I said. Can we try to get together a couple of times before Christmas break? Sure, Dave, we can try. She said this without conviction. Debbie, I want you to know that you're the only girl for me, and I want to get you something before you leave. I pulled a jewelry box from the nightstand and opened it for her. Inside was a white gold ring with an amethyst and a diamond chip on each side. Amethyst was her birthstone. Debbie's eyes grew huge and her hands went up in front of her mouth. Oh, Dave, it's beautiful. Debbie, I want you to wear it. And when you look at it, think of me, please. She slipped it on her finger and tearfully hugged me. Of course I will, Dave. After that evening, we only talked on the phone one more time before she left. I offered to give Debbie a ride, but her father had bought her a five-year-old car for her to get around in. I was disappointed in our conversation that evening and the fact that she showed no enthusiasm for what I was trying to say. I wanted her to be my girlfriend. I wanted us to have an exclusive relationship. If we were still in high school, I would have asked her to date. Instead, I was afraid she was trying to let me down gently. When Debbie was gone, I did almost nothing but work. A few times a week, I went out with the guys at the YMCA and played basketball. I spent almost every weekend at my mom and dad's house, and they made sure I was well-fed. Every other day, I called Debbie's dorm. About half the time I caught her at home. I also texted her a couple times a week. We talked and wrote about her coming down or me coming up, but we never seemed to be able to agree. Eventually, the calls and letters began to drift apart. A couple of weeks after Debbie left, I was asked if I wanted to take the exam for the electrician's apprenticeship program at work. It could take two to four years, depending on how many hours I worked per month, but I would get two years of college credit. The pay was about 20% more than I was making now, and the company paid for college-level technical classes. Even if I quit before I finished college, I would be ahead in salary level. I took the exam and passed it easily. After a while, I started the program. I loved the internship program. 
I have always loved gadgets, stereo equipment, and generally anything electronic. That's what encouraged me to study electrical engineering. And I've always had a knack for tools. I had the ability to work almost unlimited over time. And as I gained experience, the journeyman electricians would ask me to help them on back jobs, for which we usually got paid. With that money, I could buy myself anything I wanted as far as toys were concerned, but I still had a dream of finishing high school. I didn't even go on dates, although I often had opportunities to do so. I was in love with Debbie, and that was my second dream. So the money was in the bank or invested in a few investments. A couple weeks before Thanksgiving, during one of our now infrequent calls, Debbie reminded me that she would be home the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving and wouldn't have to leave until Sunday afternoon. She said she hoped she would be able to spend most of that time with me. For the first time since she left, I was excited about the possibility of seeing her again. We arranged to meet at her house after Thanksgiving dinner. Seeing her again was like an instant rush of alcohol. I was tongue-tied, but I couldn't take my eyes off her. Her dad and mom were happy to see me, and her two sisters greeted me warmly. Her dad and I instantly hit it off when it turned out that the K-13 my uncle married was his distant cousin. And I don't think any of us were too happy that Debbie hadn't visited the house since she left for school. I spent a couple hours there eating desert and watching football. Eventually, I suggested to Debbie that we go to a movie. Debbie jumped at the opportunity and we left quickly, ignoring the obvious disappointment of her mom and dad. We drove straight to my house. We fell into bed and got down to business. This time, when it was time for Debbie to leave, we knew that Christmas vacation was only a few weeks away. This time, I kissed Debbie goodbye feeling better about the separation in our relationship. Three weeks later, Thanksgiving happened again. It seemed like we had never been apart. I had two weeks off due to the holiday closing of the auto plant, so we had plenty of time to spend together. We went to Christmas parties and did holiday shopping. She spent time with my family and I spent time with hers. I helped her dad do the wiring in the basement rec room he was finishing and became his friend forever. For Christmas, I gave her amethyst earrings and a pendant that matched her ring. From her, I also received two very nice cable-knit sweaters that I thought looked great on me. Again, we spent more and more time at my apartment. A couple times, she stayed overnight at my place. I didn't know what she was telling her parents, so I didn't ask. I knew even then that I would be happy to spend the rest of my life with her like this. The day before she had to go back to school, we talked again about separating and being able to see each other every month. She was evasive again and didn't want to promise anything. Another thing that made me unhappy was that several times I told her I thought I was in love with her, and each time she smiled, hugged me or kissed me but didn't reciprocate. I brought it up on our last day together. After hugging her, I said, Debbie, I know that talking about my feelings is uncomfortable for you. I love you and I want you and I to have a future together. But you make me feel like you don't feel the same way. With tears in her eyes, she looked at me. Please, Dave, I love being with you and doing things with you. Can't we just be happy when we can be together? I'm happy when we're together, Debbie. I just want to see you more often. I want you to know that there is no one else for me. I hope you feel the same way. For the first time, Debbie's eyes slid to the side, and she wasn't looking at me. Dave, we've been so far apart and for so long. I don't expect you to sit at home and have no life. Debbie, I'm not interested in dating anyone else. No one can compare to what we have. I want to... I hope you feel the same way. Debbie hugged and kissed me, and we forgot about our conversation for a while. Later, when I thought back on it, I realized that she never responded to me. I knew she wasn't as committed to our relationship as I was. Whenever I thought about it, I became sad and depressed. So I got as busy as I could, taking all the overtime offered, working a part-time job every week, taking required college classes, and spending a couple hours at the YMCA a few mornings a week. A few weeks after vacation, one of the electricians was telling everyone about the house he was selling. His father had passed away the year before, and the house was part of an inheritance. The house was dilapidated, but was in a good neighborhood and in a good school. His family just wanted to get out from under it, and they were willing to give it away for cheap. They were even willing to enter into a five-year land purchase agreement with an inflatable balloon at the end just to get rid of it. I decided to take a closer look at it since the payments were only a little more than the rent I was paying. It was a large two-level house of over 2,000 square feet. It had four bedrooms, two baths, and sat on a large corner lot. The only thing I didn't like about it was that the large garage was not attached to the house, but was behind it about 50 feet away. The house needed a lot of work. 
My parents had lived in the house for 40 years and had hardly updated anything in it. But I knew that if I could get everything done before my five-year contract expired, the house would be worth three or four times what I paid for it. And it wouldn't be hard to get a mortgage. I made an offer, and after a little haggling, we made a deal. A couple weeks later, I moved out of the apartment and into my new house. I didn't tell Debbie about it because I wanted to surprise her. But I was the one who was surprised when she didn't seem to care. I kept trying to convince Debbie to come over. Finally, I said that if she couldn't come down, I would come up to her. When I said that, she replied that maybe we could meet halfway. We set a date in a couple of weeks, and I arranged to take a couple of days off. As the date approached, the weather in SP worsened, and it seemed like one blizzard succeeded another. A couple days before our meeting, she called to say she was having car trouble, and with the weather like this, she wanted to postpone the trip. Horribly disappointed, I agreed, and when we hung up, my mood was ruined. It looked like our next opportunity to get together would be over spring break. In the meantime, in my spare time, I've been working on the house. I asked one of the carpenters at work, who was also a builder, to help me design what I wanted the house to look like when it was finished. The finished product turned out pretty ambitious, but in the back of my mind I thought I wanted to get something that Debbie would want to live in someday. I prioritized the project. I wanted to finish the kitchen first, then the bathrooms, and then the rest of the rooms. When the weather improved, I would start the exterior work. The cost of remodeling the house was significant in terms of materials. But labor costs were minimal. Most of the craftsmen in the factory traded work among themselves. That's what I was doing. I did electrical work and general labor for those who needed it, and carpenters, glaziers, painters, or heating and cooling specialists would in turn do the work for me. It was a couple weeks before spring break when I got a call from Debbie's dad, Carl. I kept in touch with him and Debbie's mother, Angela. I even stopped by to visit them a couple times after Christmas. Both Carl and Angela knew how I felt about Debbie, and they sympathized with my frustration, which was reflected in their attempts to maintain a long-distance relationship with her. When I answered Carl on the phone, he said, How do you feel about Debbie's plans for spring break? I was confused. What do you mean? You don't know? I haven't talked to her in a week, but I'm assuming she's coming home, I said. She called last night. She's planning on going to Corpus Christi with a couple girlfriends, he said clearly disappointed. I asked her what you said when she messaged you, but she wouldn't tell me. I couldn't believe she hadn't talked to you about it. No, no, she didn't say a word. I don't know what came over her, I really don't. I asked her if she was going to stop here on her way to Texas, she said no. Her girlfriend Miranda lives in Milwaukee, and they're going to drive there to pick up the car. So they're going to drive through Wisconsin and continue south. Back they plan to come back the same way. When the meaning of his words reached me, I was angry at Debbie for the first time. Did she really care so little about this that she hadn't even talked to me about it first? She knew how much I wanted to be with her on vacation. I told her how much I couldn't wait for her to see the house. I was hoping to get her opinion on its decorating. And I asked for a couple days off so we could spend four days together while she was home. I bitterly said, It looks like she's made up her mind, Carl. Apparently, our relationship isn't important enough to her to talk to me first. I'm sorry, Dave. You don't deserve to be treated that way either, he said. We talked for a few more minutes and then hung up. Sitting in the dilapidated kitchen of what I hoped would one day be our home, I realized that no matter how much you wish and hope for something, it's not enough to make it happen. I knew now that our relationship was mostly one-sided. My dreams were not her dreams. There was nothing I could do to make her love me the way I loved her. I shook my head and wiped my eyes. I felt as if a close relative had died unexpectedly. When that happens, you feel such a huge loss. You don't stop loving them, but you realize you have to accept it and move on. The next day when I got home from my college class, there was a message on my answering machine from Debbie. Dave, I'm sorry, I missed you. Can you call me as soon as you get this? I really want to talk to you. Thanks, babe. Her voice sounded happy and uplifted. I suspected she wanted to kick my ass about not coming home for spring break. I shook my head, deleted the message, and left for work. The next day I did my part-time job almost until it was time to get off shift. As I walked through the kitchen, I noticed another message on the recorder. Again from Debbie. Not so cheerful this time. Dave, honey, please give me a call. I talked to Daddy last night, and he said he told you that my plans for spring break have changed. Please call me, okay? I can explain. I'll be in the dorm all day. This time I caught the slight concern in her voice. 
Her father must have reprimanded her for not talking to me first. I deleted the message again and went about my business. A couple days later, my mom called and asked what happened to Debbie. I asked what she meant. She said Debbie called and asked for my new address. When asked why she hadn't talked to me, she answered evasively. I hesitantly replied, Debbie and I aren't seeing each other anymore. Mom gasped, Dave, why? What happened? She and I disagreed on what was important to each of us, I said quietly. I'm so sorry, honey. I know how hard this is. Why don't you come over for dinner this Sunday and we'll celebrate your birthday, okay? Saturday was indeed my birthday. But since I was going to legally go to bars, a few guys from work wanted to take me out. So I told her I'd be there on Sunday. So my 21st birthday came and went. The guys asked me out. I had a few drinks, danced a little with some women, and turned down a couple offers for something more. I didn't hear anything from Debbie, but I didn't expect to. I wasn't sure she even remembered when my birthday was, although we talked about it coming just a couple months before hers. The next day, I had dinner with my family. Both my brothers and my sister were there. Angie, my sister, was now a freshman at a state university 30 miles away. My mom cooked my favorite meals and everyone gave me gifts. It was a wonderful time. After dinner, Angie left me alone and asked me what had happened to Debbie. Angie and I, being the closest in age, have always been close. I explained to her everything that had happened over the past year, all the frustrations of trying to keep our relationship alive, and then reached my breaking point when she blew me off to go south for spring break. Dave, I know you wondered why I didn't care much for Debbie when you started dating her, she said. I never told you that I knew Debbie's little sister, Sarah. Not well, but well enough to talk to her. We were both in the same all-party Catholic youth group our senior year of high school. After you started dating, I sat and talked with her at one of our meetings. I mentioned that I knew someone who was dating her sister. I didn't tell her it was my brother. She had a lot to say about Debbie. I don't think she loves her much. According to her, Debbie was selfish and self-centered. And because of her looks, she always got everything she wanted. According to her, even in high school, she had at least two suitors. And she was always on the lookout for another. And no matter how much her parents tried to limit her social activity, she still managed to go out a lot. I thought about what she'd said to me for a moment. Then I just shrugged and said sadly, I don't know, Angie. I didn't notice that about her. All I know is that I loved her and I think I still do. But I just can't live like that. If she doesn't feel the same way about me as I do about her, then I guess we'd better go our separate ways. Angie hugged me and said nothing more. The following weekend, Debbie's father, Carl, stopped by the house to see me. I gave him a tour of the house and grounds, showing him half a dozen projects I had been working on. He was amazed. Did you tell me how much you paid for this house? He asked. When I told him, he said, Wow, if you do all the work and renovations, this place will be worth three or four times as much. He shook his head. I can't believe you just turned 21. That's a great investment for someone twice your age. He looked at me intently. Dave. I want you to know that I would be proud to have you as my son-in-law. I haven't met anyone who works as hard as you do for what you want. A little embarrassed, I replied, Thanks, Carl, but we never got to that point in our relationship. Carl looked me straight in the eye. Maybe not, Dave, but we could understand how you felt about Debbie. And I knew where she was on the nights she said she was staying at a friend's house. No, don't feel bad about it. We always felt she was safe with you. I'm just sorry it didn't work out. I just shrugged and changed the subject. But on his way out the door, he said, Not that it matters to you, but she called and said she got to Corpus Christi okay. Then he left. For the next few months, my daily routine was pretty much the same. Factory work, housework, the occasional part-time job. Spending a couple hours in the classroom on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Playing basketball at the YMCA on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday mornings. The only thing that changed was that as the weather got warmer, I started working outside but I was pleased with how the work on the house was progressing. And I found that the more I worked, the better I slept at night. If I was up at night, I was thinking about Debbie and how much I missed her. And when I missed her, I couldn't sleep. It was a vicious cycle that could not be avoided. I received another phone message from her after she returned from Texas. I deleted it as soon as I heard her voice. It was Debbie's birthday about a month after spring break. I thought about it for a long time, but finally sent her a card. It was pretty simple, and I just signed it. I just wanted her to know that I remembered. Then the work began again. Near noon on Memorial Day Saturday, I heard someone banging on the front door. 
The plant was closed for all three days, and I was hoping to finish one particular project in the backyard and had been at it since nine in the morning. Swinging the door open, I asked, yes, somewhat irritably. Everything else I could have said instantly froze in my throat. There stood Debbie. She was as beautiful as ever, and it still took my breath away. Her eyes were wide open and a look of shock frozen on her face. I, I rang the doorbell, but there was no answer. She practically stuttered. Then she whispered, Dave, what happened to you? Huh? I looked down at myself and thought, what does she mean? I stood there in worn cropped khaki pants, work boots, and no shirt. A carpenter's tool belt hung from my hips. I was sweaty and covered in a thin layer of sawdust from the circular saw I'd been turning on and off all morning. And then it came to me that Debbie hadn't seen me in six months. I knew I'd lost 10 or 15 pounds since then. Since I bought the house in January, I'd been working like crazy. And my efforts doubled when she left for spring break. I rarely sat down at the table anymore, and I had little interest in food in general. The fat I used to carry around was practically gone. The way my clothes fit, I realized I'd lost a couple of inches in my waist and gained a couple of inches in my chest and shoulders. Plus, I hadn't shaved more than every other day lately, so I had a good two days' worth of vegetation. I also cut my hair shorter when the warm weather set in. Now that I thought about it, I felt like I was living on the edge of a precipice. I opened the door wide. Come on in, I'll turn off the radio. I stepped away from the door to the dining room and turned off the music. I walked back to Debbie standing at the front of the house. She looked a little awkward as I scrutinized her closely. She was wearing white short shorts, sandals, and a tight pastel-colored tank top. Her hair was gathered into a ponytail, and she was wearing sunglasses on her head. I noticed she was wearing the amethyst ring I had given her. She looked good. The mere sight of her lifted my spirits. Excuse me. I turned on the radio while I was working in the backyard and didn't hear the doorbell. I guess I look kind of rude. I wasn't expecting visitors, I said embarrassed. No, you look fine, Dave. You're just different, that's all. I just wanted to see how you were doing. Dad said he stopped by here the other day and was impressed with the house. It looks big. She finally took her eyes off me and looked around the living room. Would you like to take a tour? I said, smiling. Would you mind? She said somewhat timidly. Of course not. In fact, I'm even proud of the way the place is set up, said I as she started to follow me around. The house is about 2,000 square feet. It originally had four bedrooms and two baths. I'm remodeling it so it has three bedrooms and three baths. Two full baths upstairs and one downstairs. As you can see, we're rebuilding the fieldstone fireplace in the living room, and that piece of oak timber leaning against the wall will become the mantle. The floors downstairs are the original hardwood. After everything else is done, I plan to refinish the floor. We walked through the dining room, and I pointed to the blueprints on the kitchen table. A builder friend drew a blueprint of how I want to do everything. I think it's going to take over a year to do everything. I led her into the kitchen, which was the only room I'd finished. It had all new appliances, marble countertops, and new cabinets. The kitchen is the only room that is currently 100% finished, right down to the paint, I said. It's beautiful. She ran her hands over the marble. Let's go upstairs before I show you the exterior. We climbed the steps and walked down the hallway. The master bedroom overlooks the backyard and has its own private bath. I replaced the stool, sink, vanity, and tub. What's left is to put the flooring down and paint the walls. I led her past my double bed with an old country quilt spread out on it. I turned to look at her and saw that she was looking at the bedside table. Next to the phone and the bedside lamp was a 5 by 7 photograph of her. This was the picture she had given me for Christmas. Finally, she took her eyes away and looked at the bathroom. Wow, a jacuzzi tub, she said. Yeah. I ignored the obvious comment that it was big enough for two. Then I led her across the hall. The end bedroom was so small, I decided to split it up. Part of it will be combined with the closet in the master bedroom to make it big enough for a walk-in closet. The other half I'm going to turn into a full bath. I showed her the other two bedrooms, one of which was completely empty and the other used for my office. The only furnishings were a bed, a desk, a couple chairs, two shelves for books, and a small TV. We stepped back and stood on the top step, looking through the open beamed ceiling to the living room that emphasized the size of the house. Debbie put her hand on my shoulder and said, Dave, this house is huge. What are you going to do with all this space? Looking at her, I slowly replied, Well, when I bought it, I didn't envision living in it alone. 
As the implication became clear, Debbie's face reddened and she jerked her hand away. Trying to defuse the awkward situation, I said, Come on, I'll show you the back of the house and the garage. I led her down the stairs, through the dining room and sliding glass doors to the partially finished deck. This is what I'm working on this week. The deck is about 220 square feet on two levels, with steps going down to the yard. It will be big enough for a gas grill, outdoor table, chairs, and even a hot tub. I also plan to build a fence to enclose about 2,000 square feet of yard. Enough to put in a pool someday. I led her over to the garage that stood 50 feet from the house. I know it's just a garage. It's a two-and-a-half car garage, but it has a big loft for storage. I plan to add an attic room on the side of the house and make a workshop in there. That's pretty much it except for the basement, which has enough room for a finished recreation room. Debbie slowly looked around the garage, house, and yard. Well, Dave, it's obvious you're proud of what you do here, and I can see why. But how can you afford all this? I scratched my neck and smiled. Well, I don't pay for labor. I do most of it myself or trade labor with other guys. And I get discounts on materials for the builders. And honestly, I don't have anything to spend money on but this house. I see, she said thoughtfully. We chatted as we walked back up the driveway to her car. Dave, I want to thank you for the birthday card. It was really nice of you not to forget, she said quietly. I just smiled and nodded. She started to get in the car, then stopped and looked me in the face. Dave, Mom and Dad asked me to ask if you would come over for dinner on Monday. Dad is going to have a barbecue. It'll just be family there and maybe my sister's boyfriends. I shoved my hands in my pockets and stared at the floor, thinking about it. Finally, I looked up at her and said, Wouldn't that be too awkward for you? To have me around, I mean? No, Dave. It would mean a lot to me if you came. Please? She said, looking me straight in the eye. Of course I'll come. What time? With a wide smile on her face, she replied, Around two and bring a beer, okay? Smiling back at her, I said, I will. I watched her pull out of the driveway and drive away. When I turned around to go back into the house, I realized I was smiling. In fact, I smiled most of the time she was here. On Memorial Day, I cleaned myself up and even shaved. I put on some decent shorts, a polo shirt and sandals, grabbed a case of beer from the fridge and headed over to her place. Debbie greeted me warmly at the door and surprised me with a peck on the cheek. She took my hand, leading me through the house to the back patio. Her mom and dad greeted me like the son they never had. I had met her sisters the previous Christmas. Now she introduced me to her older sister's fiancé and her younger sister's boyfriend. Debbie's older sister, Elizabeth, was a more attractive version of her father. She had just graduated from college with a degree in financial management. She and her fiancé were getting married in the fall. Her younger sister, Sarah, was growing up and becoming more like Debbie. And frankly, smarter. She was just as good-looking, but different. She had just graduated from high school and had been accepted to a state college not far from home. She was somewhat of a math major. She hadn't decided yet if she was going to major in accounting or engineering. We had a great time. Her father and I talked at length about my house, and her mother made occasional comments. They were both very interested in how things worked. Debbie didn't say anything, but her sisters listened intently and occasionally made comments. Sarah and Debbie helped with the food, and every now and then I would catch their glances and whisper amongst themselves. After dinner, we all sat around, sipping beer and socializing. I noticed there was no talk of spring break or Texas. I asked Debbie if she had seen Josh this school year. We had stopped communicating, and I wondered how he was doing. She replied that she had only seen him once all semester. But Miranda saw him from time to time and even went out with him a couple times. Toward evening, I said that I should probably go home. I thanked Carl and Angela for dinner, said goodbye to everyone else, and headed for the door. Debbie jumped up, walked over to my mom, whispered something to her, and said, I'll walk you to the car. She took my hand and we walked to my car and stopped. She looked at me and said, Dave, can we talk for a few minutes? There's a little park at the end of the block. There are some picnic tables there and no one will disturb us. Suspecting that the conversation would probably be about me being invited to dinner, I just nodded and we continued down the street. We chatted about all sorts of trivia until we finally came to a park. We sat down across from each other. We both fell silent as Debbie fidgeted until finally she clasped her hands together and looked at me. Dave, I want to apologize for what I did to you over spring break. It was wrong, I know. I should have discussed it with you, but I wanted to avoid a confrontation. 
Then, when you didn't return my calls, I decided to text you, but I didn't know what to say. When I got the opportunity to go, all I could think about was that I only had two years of college left, and this might be my last chance to do it. It was selfish, I know. I didn't think about how you would feel. I knew you wouldn't be happy with me, but I didn't think you'd cut me out of your life. She looked at me with tears in her eyes. I see. Well, you've made a decision about what's important to you. It was painful and hurtful, but I figured it out, I said calmly. I shrugged. But it's over now, and so are we. We can both move on. She began to openly cry. But Dave, I don't want to break up with you. Please, I miss you, and I want to be with you. Break up with me? Debbie, we were never together. Every time I wanted to get close to you, you kept me at arm's length. You've made it clear that you value your independence more than our relationship. If you don't have the same feelings for me as I do for you, then I'd better accept that fact and move on. She looked down at her hands. I know, Dave. I... I was afraid, afraid to make a commitment. I felt like you were rushing me. The last few months without you have taught me a lot. I've realized that I do love you. And I hope you still love me. I reached across the table and took her hands in mine. Debbie, I never stopped loving you. I just realized that I can't stop loving you back. Debbie looked up at me through her tears. We can... Can we try again, Dave? I thought about it for a few minutes, but immediately realized it was what I wanted more than anything. I work at night, you work during the day. It's going to be hard to meet up, said I. It doesn't matter, Dave. Whatever you want to do is fine with me, Debbie said, holding onto my hands. I think I can be free of overtime on Saturday night. Let's plan something for Saturday or Saturday night, okay? That would be great, Dave, she said, smiling and wiping tears from her eyes. That was the beginning of our reconciliation. Things went slowly for the first couple weeks, but then we became inseparable again. During the week, I was still completely consumed with work and chores. But the weekends were spent together. I gave up over time on weekends to carve out time to spend with her. Debbie started staying with me on weekends. I don't know what her mom and dad thought of that, but I know they were glad we were back together. I involved Debbie in choosing paint, rugs, and curtains for the house. She also had a great eye for landscaping. She started coming over a couple times a week while I was at work to complete some projects she was helping me with. Once or twice, I would come home from work and find her asleep in my bed. Needless to say, she called in sick to work on those mornings. The summer flew by. The car I had been driving for several years began to require maintenance. I traded it in for an almost new van. A few weekends at the end of the summer, Debbie and I loaded it up and went camping along Lake Michigan. The last weekend before Debbie had to go back to school, we both took Friday off and went to Wilderness State Park for three days. On Saturday, we lay on the beach and basked in the sun after a brisk swim in Lake Michigan. As we lay there, I began gently stroking her face. She turned and smiled at me. Oh my God, Dave, didn't you get sated last night? I'm never satiated with you, Debbie, I said. She rolled over to me and we lay face to face, kissing each other tenderly. Debbie, will you marry me? I said. What did you say? She gasped, pulling away from me. I sat down and pulled a box out of our beach bag. I opened it and held it in front of her. I think you heard me, Debbie. Will you marry me? She sat up and looked at the three-quarter carat engagement ring in the box. Oh my God, Dave, it's beautiful. I pulled it out and put it on her finger. Is it a yes? Yes, it's a yes, Dave. I love you, I really do. The rest of the trip we talked about marriage and getting married. We both agreed that waiting until she graduated would probably be the best plan. So we decided to set a date for next summer, probably late July or August. We both knew we wanted kids, but decided it was best to wait until Debbie started building a career. I took the day off the day before Debbie was due to leave to go back to school. Debbie, myself, and our parents went out to dinner to celebrate our engagement. All three women planned to get together at Christmas to plan the wedding. Debbie and I agreed that we would decide on a date by then. Debbie stayed at my house that night and we talked quietly until morning. This time we definitely planned to meet at least once a month during the school year. I offered to drive to her place, but she said she would rather drive or we would meet somewhere halfway between school and home. In her senior year of high school, Debbie was going to live off campus. Several friends, including Miranda, asked her if she wanted to live in the same house with them. Her share of the expenses wouldn't be much more than the dorm fees. She said she was tired of living on campus. And since she had a car, getting to and from classes wouldn't be a problem. 
The next day, I kissed her goodbye and watched her get into her car and drive north. She barely made it to the end of the street and I already missed her. I slipped back into the routine of the previous year. I now had a goal of finishing the house in time for our wedding. On weekends, I tried to relax a little and spend more time with my family. On Sundays, I was constantly getting dinner invitations to my in-laws or Debbie's in-laws house. To be honest, I alternated every other weekend. Debbie's younger sister, Sarah, traveled to college from home, so she usually came to dinner too. When she arrived, we always had meaningful conversations and fun times. The last weekend in September, Debbie came home for her older sister's wedding. As you might expect, she and Sarah were bridesmaids. The wedding went off without a hitch and everyone had a great time. Debbie and I danced, drank, and laughed throughout the reception. When October came around, Debbie and I were scheduled to meet near the end of the month. A couple days before, she called and said they had a snowstorm and the car had brake failure. She didn't think she would be able to make it. I told her I would go and stay with her. She declined, preferring to reschedule our appointment for the following weekend. She needed to get her car inspected and was sure the weather would be moderate. I changed my reservation to a motel in Mackinac City. We met the following Friday and spent a nice weekend sightseeing, including a day on Mackinac Island. When she first arrived, she looked distracted and out of sorts. When I asked her what was wrong, she said she was worried about schoolwork and exams. As we sat at dinner that first night, I was holding her hands and noticed something. I asked, Debbie, where is your wedding ring? Debbie looked at her hand as if she hadn't noticed. She blushed and replied, I was doing the dishes before I left and took it off. I just forgot to put it back on. I then held up my other hand, which was sporting an amethyst ring. I guess I'm just absent-minded. I probably grabbed one thing and forgot about the other, she said unconvincingly. Well, next time remember the diamond and forget the other, said I jokingly and left the matter at that. Thanksgiving vacation came and we had a wonderful four-day weekend. Debbie spent most of it at my house. I showed her how things were progressing. We discussed a few of her decorating ideas, and I put them on the project list. We also did some shopping for light fixtures and rugs. When Debbie arrived home for Christmas, she said there were still problems with the car, and given the record snow year in UP, she wasn't sure how many times she'd be able to get back this winter. I knew that even in the nicest weather, the trip would turn into a grueling six-hour drive. Her dad and I looked at the car and decided it wasn't worth investing a lot of money in. I ended up buying a two-year-old Jeep that was still under warranty. The mechanic inspected it and said it was healthy. I gave it to Debbie and told her that now I had no excuse not to drive it home. I said it kind of humorously, but she didn't seem to find it funny. Debbie and the moms finalized the wedding plans. The date was set, the parish church and reception hall were booked. They took care of all the other details and I was glad all I had to do was put on my tux and show up. I drove down and met Debbie at St. Ignace for Valentine's Day weekend. It was too snowy and cold to do anything else but admire the rugged beauty of the shoreline and the view of the bridge. But I had booked a suite with a hot tub at the hotel and we were more than happy to spend most of our time in it, making up for the six weeks of separation. Debbie had planned to stay home for spring break, but work threw me a surprise. I was asked to go to Van Nuys, California to give a training session on the installation of new equipment that was going to be in our plant for the new model year. The training was to take about two weeks and it fell during spring break. I tried to decline, but was told I had no choice. Debbie was as disappointed as I was when I told her this. We knew our next chance to meet wouldn't be until a couple weeks later. A few days after I broke the news to her, she called me back. She asked, since I wouldn't be home for spring break, if I would be okay with her going to Florida with her roommates. We discussed the idea, and I made it clear that I wasn't very excited about it and didn't think it was appropriate for an engaged person. I would feel better if she didn't go. Besides, I wondered how she could afford it. She assured me, somewhat dismissively, that she could take care of herself and I had nothing to worry about. And her roommates offered to pay most of the expenses if she went in the Jeep. The whole conversation made me feel uncomfortable. Like the call was just a formality to back up and that she had already made her decision. It was the same feeling I'd gotten last year when she'd treated me with such disdain just to get what she wanted. I brushed it off and continued to prepare for the trip to California. The trip was long and arduous. We worked 10 to 12 hours a day, and we only managed to take one day off to sightsee. I couldn't keep in touch with Debbie, but she kept in touch with her parents, and I kept in touch with them. By the time I got home, Debbie had already gone back to school. I called her early the next morning wanting to talk to her, 
and to my surprise, a man answered the phone. Not knowing if I had dialed the number correctly, I asked, Who is this? Tom. Who are you looking for? Debbie Koenigsknecht? Is this her number? Sure, hold on a second. I heard him shout Debbie's name. In the background, I heard Debbie say, What? And the man replied, The phone. I thought I heard Debbie whisper, You know you're not supposed to answer the phone. Who is it? And the man replied, I don't know. Some guy. Debbie picked up the phone and said, Hello? It's me, Debbie, I said quietly. Hello, darling. You're calling awfully early. How was California? She said hurriedly. Didn't see anything much except the inside of the plant. Who answered your call? Oh, it was Tom, Miranda's boyfriend. On a weekday? So early in the morning? Well, he sometimes spends the night with Miranda. You know how it is, Dave. She said this somewhat defensively. Yeah, I know how it is, Debbie. But I don't like guys staying overnight at my fiancé's house. I said a little upset. Dave, you have nothing to worry about. They've been going out together for a while now. Are we going to get together soon? I missed you on vacation, love. I let her distract me and we discussed that we would meet in Harbor Springs in a couple weeks. I asked her about Florida and she vaguely replied that they had a good time and the weather was great. That conversation gave me an uneasy feeling, but it faded away in the rush before graduation and wedding plans. Harbor Springs was the last place we met before graduation. Debbie was doing well in all subjects and was on track to graduate on time. It was a remarkable accomplishment. And the chain store where she had been interning for the past couple of years offered her a permanent job as a manager, and she accepted. Debbie's parents and I had already talked about coming to the ceremony. When I mentioned this to Debbie, she tried to downplay the importance of her attendance. The ceremony would only take an hour, and she wanted to leave right afterward. But I assured her that there was no way I would miss the event, and that was the end of it. As graduation approached, Carl, Angela, and I made plans to go there together. The event was to be held on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. We were disappointed when Debbie told us that she would be at the senior party the night before. And the next morning, she and her roommates would be busy turning in the house to the landlord and heading straight to the auditorium. So even though we arrived the night before, we wouldn't see her until after the ceremony. Most graduation events go the same way. You listen to speakers from the school, the honorary graduates speak, the guest of honor speaks, then the seniors are called up to receive their diplomas. Then all the graduates toss their hats in the air, and that's the end of it. We walked out of the auditorium to the street where the graduates crowded around, congratulating each other and their families. And, of course, taking pictures in their gowns, expressing relief or surprise that they had finally made it. Finally, we spotted Debbie among a group of graduates posing for pictures. As we approached, Debbie saw us, separated from the group, walked over, hugged and kissed us all. She excitedly showed us her diploma, and we took turns taking pictures with her in our gowns. Her dad said something to her about seeing her friends. Debbie looked back at the group still crowded around her and quickly said, Most of them aren't really friends, just acquaintances. But there is someone you should meet. Wait here, I'll get her. And she rushed towards the crowd and plunged into it. A couple minutes later, she surfaced, dragging a familiar face behind her. Mom, Dad, this is Miranda. My roommate. Dave, you remember Miranda, don't you? I said. Of course, it's good to see you again, Miranda. It's been a while. Miranda looked awkward as we all shook hands. We chatted for a few minutes when I finally asked, Miranda, is Josh here? He graduated too, didn't he? I was hoping to see him. Miranda shook her head and replied, He's not here, Dave. I think he got a job somewhere on the West Coast and had to leave. Debbie quickly interjected, Dave, Mom, Dad! Miranda has agreed to be my maid of honor. Isn't that great? They all immediately started talking about the wonderful news. I couldn't help but notice that Miranda didn't seem to be thrilled with the idea. After a few minutes of discussion, Miranda bowed out and said she had to meet someone. She stepped aside and joined a group of three or four guys who I noticed were looking at us. One of them looked like he was angry about something. I mentioned this to Debbie, and as soon as she looked that way, she said, We should get going. My car is already packed and in the parking lot. She took my hand and headed away from the crowd, with Carl and Angela following her. After stopping for a celebratory lunch at one of the good restaurants in town, we began the long drive home. I drove the Jeep along with Debbie. Her mom and dad rode in the back. The ride was fun, 
Debbie and I chatted about the wedding, honeymoon plans, and generally just chatting. I was disappointed when Debbie told me she was going to spend the night with her parents. She sympathized with me, but said she needed to stay home for a couple of days and spend time with them. And her parents weren't okay with her moving in with me before the wedding, even though they knew we often spent the night together. The weeks leading up to the wedding flew by. We both worked and tried to do as much as we could in the house. Most of the interior was finished except for the hardwood floors that needed to be refinished. Above the garage, I did the rough finish on the workshop, but we'll finish that over the winter. I was beginning to doubt the house would ever be finished. The wedding day went by like a blur. Debbie was a beautiful bride and everything turned out great. The wedding was quite small, only about 150 guests. It surprised me that Miranda was the only one Debbie invited from college and she didn't even bring her boyfriend. But everyone had a great time. The next day we went on our honeymoon to the Caribbean island of St. Martin. We spent 10 wonderful days in the sun. We ate gourmet meals every night. We drank Heineken beer, French wine, and pina coladas. I think we made love every day. I surprised Debbie by taking her to a couple of beaches where no clothes were allowed. She was reluctant and shy at first, but after the first couple hours of camping, she took to it like a duck to water. I discovered that she had a tendency toward exhibitionism in her. The sight of her walking around the beach with that tan will stay with me for the rest of my life. It didn't hurt that she was probably one of the three most beautiful women on all the beaches we visited. Back home, we relaxed and were ready to enter married life. I began a six-month rotation on the day shift, the first time I had worked the day shift since starting the internship program. This limited the amount of part-time work I could do, but allowed us to be together every night. It also helped us establish a social life with old high school friends that we had rarely seen over the past few years. Financially, we were comfortable. So much so that at least half of Debbie's paycheck was going toward paying off her student loans. We wanted to seriously start paying them off before we had kids. Almost every weekend we went to parties or to a rock and roll bar to dance. We even managed to go camping twice more before the weather got too cold. The group of friends based on our high school socializing sort of coalesced into a tight social circle. We were all fairly young, had kids, or were planning to have them in the near future. Some of us would occasionally go to bars together, but mostly we would get together for barbecues, chili, or just a party at someone's house. I was sorry when it was time to go back to nights out. On the one hand, it would make it easier to fulfill those lucrative part-time jobs and chores, but on the other hand, it would limit our social activities. I was about six months away from getting my journeyman's license, and once I got it, I would be able to alternate day shifts more regularly. One side effect I hadn't thought of was the reduction in our sex life. The fact that we were home every night extended our honeymoon. All winter long, we stoked the fireplace four or five nights a week. It seemed that every time we cuddled in front of the fire, we forgot about everything but each other. When I went back to nights except weekends, the sex practically disappeared. Debbie didn't like me waking her up in the middle of the night when I got home, and in the mornings, she was in too much of a hurry getting ready for work to try to wake me up to start doing anything. Eventually, we resorted to one of us taking a half day off during the week just to connect. Once a week, either she would take a day off or I would take half a night off. It wasn't ideal, but it was the best we could do. Winter turned to spring, and I was in a hurry to finish a couple of chores before summer. I was almost finished installing the hot tub for the deck and contracted to install the fencing. I was also finishing up the workshop over the garage. We started talking about having a baby and what we wanted to do with the nursery. One day, the conversation turned to baby safety and the benefits of using a baby monitor to keep an eye on the little ones. Since I was an electrician, I took it a step further and installed an intercom throughout the house. I even hooked up the deck and workshop to it. Now, no matter where you were, in the house or garage, the nursery could be monitored. Around this time, several other electricians invited me to become a junior partner in a business they were creating. The outside work was gaining momentum, and we decided we wanted to run it as a legitimate business. I ran a second phone line to the house and workshop so I could work with them separately. It wasn't necessary, but it was a tax write-off. As the weather warmed, Debbie and I managed to get out for a long weekend camping trip about once a month. Sometimes we went with one or two other couples in our group. Sometimes we went alone. In June, Debbie completed her first year of service. This event was the impetus for Debbie to stop taking the pill. Then in July was our first anniversary. We wanted to do something special and often talked about a trip to Yellowstone Park. We decided August was a good time, and John and Kathy asked if they could come with us. 
Slowly coming out of my daze, I realized I was sitting in a lounge chair on our patio, staring off into space. I had finished washing the van and didn't even remember doing it. For three years, three years, Debbie and I dated, got engaged, and married. She was the only one I had desired since the moment I met her. Could she have done this to me? I thought about John and what I knew about him. He graduated from Gabriel High School a year ahead of Debbie. They knew each other, but they weren't friends. John was now the owner of a construction company with several partners, including his best friend Craig. Craig and his wife were also part of our social circle. I had known who John was for a few years now, but I hadn't made friends until Debbie came home from school. I remembered hearing a story some time ago that John had a previous partner who had suddenly left the business amid rumors that John was having an affair with his wife. There was nothing more to it, and I assumed it was just bar talk. John and Craig were real party people. They agreed to have happy hours on Friday nights with other construction workers. They extolled it as an opportunity to make business connections. I remember John's wife, Kathy, complaining bitterly that it was just an excuse to get drunk and sit around until the bars closed. As I sat and pondered the jumble of thoughts running through my head, I suddenly remembered a strange incident. Last winter, just before I switched days, I was working on some equipment at an auto plant. I noticed four or five guys in suits and helmets walking down the aisle. I was idly watching them when I thought one of them looked familiar to me. It was my former college roommate, Josh. I called out to him and he stopped and his face lit up when he saw me. We hugged and stroked each other's backs. He had some time on his hands and we had a cup of coffee in the cafeteria. It turned out that he had gotten the job with a California company as a manufacturer's representative for the equipment they supplied. But he worked out of the Chicago office and one of his clients was General Motors. His territory was Indiana, Ohio, and Michigan. He said he spent Monday in the office every week, and Tuesday through Friday he was on the road. We got to talking about work, and I told him about the internship program and my intention to go back to school and get a degree someday. But then I laughed and said, of course my wife will have something to say about that. A surprised expression appeared on his face. You got married? Congratulations. When did that happen? I told him last August and asked him if he was still single. He just shook his head and said he was just too busy to have a serious relationship. So tell me, what's her name? He asked, smiling. Come on, Josh, you know her. Debbie Koenigsknecht, you introduced me to her before I even left school. Remember? Of course I remember. She was Miranda's roommate all through college. So you two dated again after college? He asked, puzzled. Hell no, Josh. I wasn't going to let her go after I met her. We dated all of Debbie's last two years of high school, and in fact, got engaged right before the start of her senior year. A whole series of emotions flashed across Josh's face that I couldn't decipher before he weakly said, Oh, I never heard that. Suddenly, he looked at his watch and said he didn't have time and had to go. I walked him out the door, but before he disappeared, I asked him for his business card and told him I would like to call him. He replied, Sure, sure shook my hand and walked briskly away. At that moment, I marveled at his sudden impulse to leave. Over the next month, I called him several times to see how we would meet. Both times he said he had conflicts and would call me back, but he never did. Now, reflecting on his reaction along with other bits and pieces of things that came to mind and my discovery this morning, I realized that he was shocked by the news that the two of us were getting married. I suspected that he knew something about Debbie and had gone out of his way not to talk about her. It followed that whatever he knew wasn't good. I pulled his business card out of my wallet and pondered it for a few minutes before making a decision. It was Monday, and I knew he had to be in the office. I picked up the phone in the kitchen and quickly dialed his number. When he picked up, I said quietly, Josh, it's Dave. Oh, hey, Dave, what's up? He said warily. I was hoping we could get together this week when you're in the area, said I. I don't think this week is going to be a good week. Look, Josh, I know you're blowing me off and I'm pretty sure I know why. I'm learning some things about Debbie that I'm sure you know about, and I'd really like to talk to you about it, I said simply. There was silence on the line for a couple minutes before he said, Are you sure you really want to do this, Dave? Wouldn't it be better to leave it in the past? No, Josh. Because whatever it was, I think it's still going on. We were once good friends, and I trust you to be honest. There was silence in the receiver again, and finally he said, Okay, Dave, I can change my schedule and get there tomorrow. Would that work? That would be great, Josh. Let's meet at the Westgate Tavern near the assembly plant.
Do you know where that is? Sure, the earliest I can get there is about an hour. Thanks, Josh. I know you don't want to do this, but it means a lot to me. We hung up and I went back to my business to get my affairs in order after my trip to Yellowstone. I thought about working on a couple projects around the house that were in the middle of something, but I thought, what the hell? Does this really mean anything anymore? The next day I arrived at the bar a little before one o'clock and settled into a booth. About 15 minutes later, Josh walked in and spotted me. He walked over, shook my hand, and sat down without smiling. Beer and a burger? I asked. He nodded, we ordered, and for a few minutes we just stared into our glasses. Finally, I said, Why don't I tell you about my life from the time I met Debbie until we got married? Then you can tell me about what you saw from your perspective in college, okay? I told him about how we dated for a year, how we broke up, and how we made up. I told him how much I loved her and how hard I tried to make her mine. I told him about our engagement and the year leading up to the wedding. How happy it all made me. I told him about the ups and downs and all the little things that had happened that I now questioned. When I finished, Josh cleared his throat and said, I guess I don't understand what's bothering you, Dave. Then I told the story of the trip to Yellowstone, what I found while cleaning out the van, and the conclusion I couldn't hide from. When I finished, Dave looked at me in disgust. Damn, women! and shook his head. He hesitated for a few minutes, then said, You know I still see Miranda from time to time? I shook my head. No. She still lives in her hometown of Milwaukee, but occasionally comes to Chicago on business. Anyway, after we ran into you and you told me about the wedding, I called her and arranged to meet her for dinner the next time she was in town. She's usually pretty friendly. She and I had met a few times back in college. We even hooked up once, and we were still friends. But as soon as I told her I ran into you, she tried to keep it quiet. I got mad at her and accused her and Debbie of trying to poach you. I made her feel so bad that she finally laid it all out. And you know, I think she was relieved. Miranda and Debbie were roommates for the last three years of college. And it turns out Miranda was the only one Debbie confided in about you. I have to warn you, Dave, some of them are pretty ugly. Couldn't be uglier than my imagination, I said bitterly. Well, only you can judge that he said awkwardly. You never knew that I spent the first semester of our junior year studying abroad in Europe. That's partly why you and I lost touch. When I finally returned from my second semester, I had forgotten that you and Debbie had dated before I left school. Debbie went on with her life as she had last year, seeing each other a couple times a week. But this time her dating was more serious. She dated the guy for a month or so. As soon as he started getting serious, she'd dump him. And she was sleeping with these guys, and it wasn't some big secret. I suspect Miranda was pretty much the same way. Anyway, Miranda said that Debbie just couldn't stay away from guys, even though she was dating at home. She told Miranda that she had the best of both worlds. A guy back home who loved her and freedom 400 miles away from home where she could do whatever she wanted. Then she tricks you into going with Miranda to Texas for spring break. The high school fraternity guys were going there, and they invited Debbie and Miranda to join them. I guess Debbie didn't give it much thought until she got back and you didn't want anything to do with her. She couldn't deal with it. She told Miranda that she would do anything she could to get you back. Then, when Debbie returned for her senior year, she told Miranda that she was engaged to you. Miranda thought that meant things had changed. But it hadn't. Debbie is back where she left off in the spring. But, but, but how did she manage to hide it? She had a three-quarter carat engagement ring. And for Christmas, I gave her a two-year-old Jeep for Christmas, and the title was in my name. Hell, she came to visit me in the state almost every month, I said. Josh shrugged. She never wore a wedding ring in high school, and she told everyone that her dad gave her the Jeep. Anyway, in May, before school left for the summer, Miranda and Debbie arranged to rent a house near campus for senior year. Miranda's boyfriend at the time was in on the deal. Oh yeah, Tom. He picked up the phone when I called the house one morning. I said weakly. Josh looked at me pityingly. Miranda's boyfriend was Dan. Tom was Debbie's boyfriend. He stayed over from last school year. She asked him if he wanted to room with Dan when he moved in. They were splitting the cost between the four of them, not the three of them. The four of them lived in that house until graduation. I covered my face with my hands and tried to hold back a shiver. Shit, shit, shit. That's not all, Dave. The four of them went to Florida for spring break. I heard Tom paid Debbie's way since they were traveling in her, I mean your Jeep. I shook my head. How did she and Miranda keep me a secret from their boyfriends? 
After all, I called there every week and texted. They knew Debbie was seeing someone at home, but they pretended it was no big deal. Miranda was the only one who knew it was serious. On the eve of prom night, a group of high school seniors had a private party at one of the college fraternities. I guess Debbie and Tom spent the whole night there. When they got up in the morning to go to the graduation ceremony, Debbie informed Tom that she was coming home and getting married. He didn't take it very well. Two things came to my mind. First, the angry guy at the graduation ceremony, which Debbie seemed very eager to avoid. And second, the fact that Debbie didn't want to spend the night with me when we got home that evening after she had spent the previous night with her boyfriend. It wasn't hard to guess why. God, what an idiot I was. I'd been lied to from the beginning. How can you be such a cold-hearted, conniving bitch and hide it for so long? I whispered, tears streaming down my face. Josh turned away from me and said, I don't know, Dave. She just did it. Miranda and her were friends, but by the end of it, it even shocked her. And the last thing she wanted was to be Debbie's maid of honor and look you in the face. Hell, she was still dating Dan at the time of the wedding and was hesitant to bring him for fear he'd blab something. We talked some more and had another beer. I couldn't swallow a bite of food as I suspected I would throw up. I knew there would be more tears afterward. Finally, Josh said, What are you going to do, Dave? It's over, Josh. Three years. Three damn years I put into this relationship. Three damn years she lied to me over and over again. She was the most important thing in my life from the day I met her. But to her, apparently our relationship meant nothing, I said bitterly. We sat in silence for a few minutes while I pulled myself together. I now understood how a man could kill in the heat of passion. Everything you told me was before we were married. I must find out what she is doing now, for my own peace of mind. And maybe I'll get an answer as to why. Then she'll be a thing of the past. I said this through clenched teeth. When we finally said goodbye at his car, I said, I'd appreciate it if you didn't let Miranda know we're together. I don't want Debbie to suspect I know anything. Of course, Dave. Call me any time. I'm sorry I blew you off. I just didn't want to be at the center of things. We shook hands and went our separate ways. I got home about an hour before I had to leave for my shift and just in time to catch a call from Debbie. She usually tried to call during the day and if we didn't connect, I called her during my lunch break at work. I tried to act as normal as possible, although the sound of her voice made me furious. She teased me when I was going to come home early this week to do a little pranking. I tried to feign regret when I told her I couldn't ask for a single day off this week due to many people going on vacation, which was a lie. Then she suggested asking for Wednesday or Thursday off. Again, I regretfully told her that I had a part-time job on those days and would not be home. Another lie. Suspecting she wouldn't agree, I told her I would be home all day Friday if she was interested. She hesitated for a moment, then said she didn't think she could find any free time on Friday. After saying I love you to each other, we hung up the phone. I stared wistfully at the phone, remembering what John had said on the trip to Yellowstone. He'd said he'd be working in Southfield all week, but laughingly whispered to me that he'd be back on Friday for happy hour. I looked for Kathy's work number and dialed it. When she answered, I asked if John was out of town and she said he wasn't. I told her I wanted to borrow a couple tools from him. She said he would be back on Friday and then Riley remarked that it would probably be just in time for happy hour. I told her I'd contact him over the weekend and hung up. I figured that if Debbie and John were seeing each other regularly, they would get together again at the first opportunity. Given that John would be out of town until Friday and I would be home all weekend, it made sense that Friday night would be the best chance. And then I remembered something from earlier in the summer. Saturday morning, I got up before Debbie. Took the coffee out on the deck, and the hot tub was a mess. The cover was off, and there were a couple empty beer cans lying around. A couple of damp beach towels were thrown over the railing. When Debbie stood up, I asked her about it. She was a little embarrassed and said she had gone for a drink with a couple of girls from the office after work, and they had gone back to the house and used the hot tub. She apologized for not cleaning up after herself. Now I was wondering who was actually in the tub. Since then, she has mentioned several times about going out with her girlfriends on Friday nights. Going to bed that night after work, I found that I couldn't bear the thought of sleeping next to her. I ended up lying on the bed in the study. She was so surprised that she called me a couple hours after coming to work to ask why I hadn't gotten to bed. I told her I thought I had a stomach ailment and didn't want to wake her up. She advised me to take some Pepto-Bismol and go to bed. Before hanging up, she said, by the way, have you checked the pH level in the hot tub since we got back from Yellowstone? 
I answered her. No, I certainly haven't. Can you do that, honey? I wouldn't want it to deviate too much from the norm if we suddenly want to use it, she said teasingly. As she hung up the phone, I thought, looks like someone's about to use the hot tub, and it's not going to be me. Whatever is going on, it looks like it's going to be happening here on Friday night. I immediately decided that I was going to take Friday off. That night at work, I started thinking about the fact that I needed to gather information and evidence somehow. I knew that with the help of my electrician buddies, I could probably bug the house, but probably not on such short notice. And then it hit me. The intercom system I had installed when I was a kid. The next morning, I grabbed my tools and started removing the intercom faceplates. I discovered that by changing just a couple wires, I could lock each unit in transmit mode. I changed them all, including the one on the deck next to the hot tub. Now the only unit that was receiving a signal was in my workshop above the garage. I tested them all with a portable radio receiver. From the workshop, I could hear the radio in every room. Deciding to go even further, I ran to an electronics store and bought a half dozen ultra-sensitive miniature microphones. I replaced the microphones in the intercoms with them and found that this increased their sensitivity by about 20%. When I finished the work, I sat in the workshop and thought that now that I had the ability to monitor what was going on in the house, I should be able to capture the information. I had an old dinosaur of a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder that one of the electricians had given me to mess around with. I recorded music on it and would occasionally play it while I was fiddling. I took it out and put the microphone to the intercom speaker. I tested it by turning on the radio from several rooms in the house and played the sound. Everything worked perfectly. The reel was so big I thought I could probably record over six hours on it. I got up and looked out the attic window. The garage was at such an angle that I could see the backyard, the deck, and the sliding glass door to part of the kitchen. Upstairs, I could also peek out the master bedroom window if the curtains were up. But at night, I'd likely only see shadows unless the light was just right. I decided that sound would be enough for what I needed. That evening after work, I called home as usual. Debbie and I chatted for a while. She told me how much she missed me and wished I would come home early. I feigned longing and sadness that I couldn't do that. I told her we'd catch up over the weekend. She casually asked if the hot tub was okay, and I said it was another lie. That night I slept on the cot again, as I had all week. On Friday, Debbie called just before I was supposed to leave for my shift. She said she wanted to let me know that she would be joining her girlfriends for drinks and possibly dinner after work. She wanted me to know that in case I tried to call and she wasn't home. I told her no problem and that I had overtime scheduled that night, so I would be a little late as well. The blatant manipulation and outright lies that were now so obvious just stunned me. And she was so at ease with it. How had I allowed myself to be fooled for three years? Was it her beauty? Was it that I was so in love with love that I didn't notice everything else? Did I have some huge character flaw that allowed her to do this to me? As I pondered these questions, I moved the van to a cul-de-sac a couple streets behind our house. Our sparsely developed neighborhood had a path through the woods that I could use to stealthily approach the back of the garage. I entered through the back door and went up to the workshop. I sank tiredly into an old battered chair I kept there. Leaning back in the chair, I closed my eyes, suddenly feeling tired from several days without enough rest and constant mental strain. Suddenly my eyes flew open and I realized it was dark inside and outside. I was awakened by the noise of the garage door opening. I looked at the clock and was surprised that it was almost 8 o'clock. I had slept for almost three hours. I tiptoed over to the door leading to the garage and opened it slightly. I saw the jeep pull up and made out the top of Debbie's head as she stepped back out. I crept up to the dormer window and saw the edge of the car in the driveway, and in the dim light of the porch light I could make out John standing there. They hugged, then stepped toward the house and disappeared. Through the intercom, I heard the keys rattle in the lock, the door open, and a murmur of voices. I quickly turned on the recorder and sat down on the workbench from where I could look out the window and watch the back of the house. Just be patient, said Debbie, giggling. I heard John mutter something in response. I need to go to the bathroom. Pour me a glass of wine and grab a beer, she said, walking through the kitchen. I heard her hit the answering machine button on the counter as she walked by and was answered, No new messages. A minute later I saw the light come on in our bedroom, and I walked past the open window into the master bathroom. I could hear her calling, the toilet flushing, and the water running into the sink. Meanwhile, I could hear John rummaging through our pantry, bottles clinking. I heard the cork pop as he opened the wine and poured a glass. 
Then the refrigerator door opened and I heard him pop the lid off the beer. I gritted my teeth as it was obvious he knew where everything was and made himself at home. Debbie came out of the bathroom and was in front of the bedroom window again. She walked over to the dresser and pulled something out of the bottom drawer. Standing up, she slipped it over her shoulders and tied it. The shimmering silver fabric told me it was one of the perios I'd bought her in St. Martin on our honeymoon. She turned toward the door, and the bedroom light went out. A moment later, in the dim light of the kitchen, I saw her walk past the sliding glass door. Wow, that's quite an outfit, said John. Thanks, does it get your attention? said Debbie and laughed. Sounds to me like Dave is wasting his attention on it, he replied. The perio I bought her for her honeymoon. I thought bitterly. She usually saved it for special occasions. Now she was wearing it for him. Shit, let's just go upstairs, Debbie, said John, almost whimpering. We've got all night ahead of us. Dave's working late. They sat and drank and talked and laughed like they didn't give a damn. It was obvious they were comfortable being here and together. It was obvious that this wasn't the first time. John stepped out of the tub and got another beer. When he returned, he stood on the step in the water in front of Debbie. Did you see Craig's face when we left the bar and you asked if I'd come over for a while? He laughed. Yeah, I think he was just a little jealous, she said absentmindedly. John sipped his beer and said, Yeah, he was a little pissed off. But it's not like you haven't had fun with him before. You two tell each other everything, don't you? Usually, he said with a slight chuckle. It was only once, and it will never happen again, she said firmly. Oh, why? Because the difference between you two is that Craig has a few beers and can't keep it up. And you, lover, no matter how much you drink, you're always having a blast. After a while, John said, Making love in the van in Yellowstone was so cool. It was great to beg for a camping trip so we could be alone. Debbie laughed. If Dave and Kathy only knew, all they could talk about was the lake, fishing, and the view. Ha, I think I have the best view. And gosh, how I needed it. That was the only time on the whole trip, complained John. What's the matter? Are you and Kathy not getting along? It's fine by her standards. Ever since Jake was born, she's had this as sexes for procreation, not recreation attitude. Now every time I want fun, it takes some serious negotiating. Debbie laughed. Poor baby. Thank goodness you accepted my invitation to happy hour that Friday and we hit it off. You can thank Dave for that. If he hadn't gone to second shift, I may never have had that urge. Besides, if it weren't for me, you'd just be hitting on someone else. Maybe so, but you're the most beautiful woman I've ever been with. But yeah, I should thank him for not doing the work for you. Don't get me wrong, he does a great job. But you're here and he's not. After a few moments of silence, John said, Why did you two get together in the first place? It doesn't sound like true love to me. When I was in college, I had a lot of boyfriends. But I liked to have a boyfriend when I came home. Dave became that guy. He was a persistent and nice guy. Decent looking. When we were together, I thought it would be nice to get married. But then I'd go back to college and I wasn't so sure anymore. But when you had all those college boyfriends, what convinced you to decide to go for it? Damn it, John, look at this house. He could be at better homes and gardens. He makes at least twice as much as all those frat boys. Of course, he works twice as hard, too. But Dave gives me whatever I want. I've got him wrapped around my finger. Once we have kids, I'll probably never work again. Debbie sighed and threw her head back. Oh, yeah, I'll have everything. A nice house, nice cars, a couple kids, and a husband who makes a lot of money and is kind enough to change shifts a couple times a year, letting me play sometimes. What more could a girl want? When she said that, I grunted and leaned my back against the wall. I felt like I'd been punched. Was this really what our relationship was about? Just money and stuff? Since we're talking about what a girl wants, how about we go up to the bedroom for a while, suggested John. Come on, Debbie, let's go upstairs. Sure, said Debbie, giggling. Okay, I thought to myself. I've heard enough. Time to kick that asshole out of my house. I pulled out my work phone and dialed our home number. When the phone rang, I heard Debbie say, Shh, it's probably Dave. Shit, I told him not to call. Are you going to answer it? asked John. No, let it go to the answering machine. After the fourth ring, the answering machine picked up. After the beep, trying to speak normally, I said, Hey, baby, you're probably still out. I'm still not feeling very well today. My boss let me leave early, so I'll be home soon. Bye. I then leaned back in my chair and watched and listened as everything around me went flying off in different directions. 
Debbie jumped to her feet, grabbed a towel, and said, John, you have to leave now. What? Why? We have time. No, no, he told me that sometimes he can get home in 15 to 20 minutes with a little traffic, and if he goes through all the traffic lights. I have to clean everything up and look like I just got home in time for his arrival. Now come out and help me put the cover back on the hot tub. John continued to grumble and complain as he helped her with the cover. Damn it, John! Shut up and get dressed! Apparently, she picked up his clothes and threw them at him, and I could hear her picking up beer cans. They both went into the house, and I heard her tell him to call her next week and then slam the door shut. I listened as his car started and pulled out of the driveway. I stopped looking out the window and settled back in my chair. For a while, I could hear Debbie fussing inside, the TV running, and her rinsing dishes in the sink. I continued to sit there, thinking about my life, my marriage, and my future. The last thing I heard from the house was Debbie's irritated muttering, Damn it, Dave! You ruined my evening, so where are you? And I thought, isn't this just too damn bad? I closed my eyes for a few minutes, and then realized I hadn't heard any sounds in a while. I looked at the clock. It was past midnight. The house was quiet and dark. Only the porch light was on. I turned off the tape recorder, went out the back door of the garage, and walked back to the van. I pulled up to the house and stopped in the driveway. Without turning on the light, I quietly slipped into the house. Not wanting to sleep, I grabbed a beer from the fridge and walked out onto the patio. I sat in the dark, looking up at the stars and thinking about the fact that I would have to end it tomorrow. Depression loomed over me like a dark cloud. Sighing, I stood up and turned toward the house. In doing so, I caught my foot on something that swept toward the hot tub. I reached down and picked up what turned out to be a wallet. I stepped into the kitchen and opened it. In the nightlight, I saw John's driver's license. I walked slowly up the stairs and froze for a moment at the bedroom door, listening to Debbie's steady breathing. I turned toward my office and hid the bed so I could sleep alone again. I threw my wallet on the desk and a bunch of stuff spilled out of it. I reached for the bag labeled Trojan Ultra Thin. I slowly put it back on the table and laid down on the bed and pulled the blanket over me. I slowly woke up to the sunlight streaming through the window. The faint noise of the shower could be heard in the bathroom. Everything that had happened the day before came back to me overnight. Staggering to my feet, I rose to my feet and shuffled to the other bathroom to do my business. Afterwards, I washed my face and looked in the mirror at my discolored eyes. I returned to our bedroom just as Debbie came out of the bathroom wrapped in a towel. Hey, babe. What happened to you last night? She said. What do you mean? Said I, a little embarrassed. You said you were coming home early and then you didn't. She walked over to me and smacked me on the lips. Something came up and the boss didn't want to let me go until midnight, said I. Are you feeling okay? You need a shave, honey, she said. I'm still a little nauseous, was the plain truth. She smiled softly at me. I have something that will make you feel better. I stood there without moving and looked into her eyes. So what can you provide me, slut? You want to get pregnant, don't you? Then next time you go out with John, tell him not to use protection. Debbie's face turned as white as the sheets on the bed. Her mouth opened and closed without making a sound. Or maybe Craig. Of course, you'll have to keep him away from the beer so he can last long enough. Finally, Debbie managed to squeak weakly. What? What did you say? I pulled my face right up to her nose and said grimly, I think you heard me. Now get out of my house, I practically shouted. She was so shocked and surprised that she rolled away from me, fell to the other side of the bed and landed with a thud. Her head peeked out over the bedding and she stared at me. Her eyes were as big as saucers and her mouth was ajar until she finally managed to stammer out, You? You? You don't. You don't make sense. No? Or maybe Tom Terrific. Do you remember Tom? Your roommate in your senior year of college? I said it sarcastically, which elicited a sharp gasp from her. I turned to her drawers and opened a couple of them. I tossed her a pair of jeans and a shirt and said, Get dressed now. You're leaving. She stood on the other side of the bed from me and started hooting. But, but Dave, I live here. Not anymore. Now get dressed or you're going outside looking like that. I grabbed my clothes and stormed into the room. I pulled a phone book out of a drawer and found the number for Yellow Cab. I called and asked for a cab as fast as they could send one. Debbie sat on the edge of the bed and sobbed. What don't you understand, bitch? All I wanted was for her to get out of here as soon as possible. I rummaged through the closet and tossed her a pair of sandals. Please, Dave, I love you. 
don't do this to me. Furious, I said, you love me? What the hell does that mean? You're a lying, cheating whore who doesn't know what love is. She collapsed on the floor, crying and wrapping her arms around her head. She just sat on the floor, covering her face with her hands and sobbing. I grabbed a glass of water and poured it over her head. She hissed and struggled to get to her feet. She had to hold onto the counter to keep from falling over, so upset was she. At that moment, a honk was heard from the side of the driveway. She raised her head and whispered, What is it? It's your cab. You're going for a ride. But, but, but what about my Jeep? I, I have a Jeep. No, I have a Jeep. It's registered in my name, remember? She watched in horror as I picked up her key ring and removed her house and car keys from it. Then I tossed the key ring into her purse and shoved the purse into her hands. Come on, let's go. I took her hand and pulled her toward the side door. She tried to speak, sobbing and hiccuping, but I wasn't listening. I pushed her into the back seat of the cab and closed the door. Leaning into the cab, I handed the driver $50 and told him to take her to 5,935 West Barnes Road. The driver looked back at the nearly hysterical woman in the back seat. Are you sure? He said. Yes, that's where she lives. And here's another 20 to make sure she doesn't come back here. Will do. And he quickly put the car in reverse gear and pulled out of the driveway. I watched them pull away and then slowly made my way back into the house. Pulling a beer out of the fridge, I collapsed into a kitchen chair and stared at the wall until my rage subsided. It was over. It really was over. For almost three years, my life had revolved around thoughts of Debbie. All my actions had been focused on making her happy. I felt empty and lost when I realized it was all over. For a while, I just sat there, tears streaming down my face. Eventually, I started thinking about what I needed to do next, and what I needed to do after this, and so on and so forth. And then I laughed with relief, realizing that I had a plan. And my life wasn't over. I grabbed my phone and dialed a number. Carl? It's Dave. I wanted to let you know that Debbie is on her way to your house. She's no longer welcome here. You can send someone over for the rest of her things. And no, I don't want to talk about it right now. Bye. And I hung up the phone. I sat there sipping my beer and feeling the tension leave my body. When the beer was finished, I went upstairs, took a long hot shower, shaved, and put on clean clothes. I stood in our bedroom wondering where to start. I grabbed some boxes and dumped all of Debbie's toiletries into them. Then I started shaking out the contents of Debbie's closets and drawers into trash bags. When I was done, a huge pile had formed on the floor. I took the box into the room to pack Debbie's college textbooks. As I did so, I noticed John's wallet on the table. Pensively, I picked it up and began leafing through the contents. Having made my decision, I picked up the phone and dialed his number. After a few rings, Kathy picked up. I had always liked Kathy. She was smart, pretty, hardworking, and fun. I felt bad about what I was about to do, but she deserved to know the truth. Katie? It's Dave. Is John here? Hi, Dave. He's still in bed. Can I ask him to call you when he gets up? No, just tell him he can come and get his wallet anytime. His wallet? How did his wallet end up there? She said, puzzled. I think he lost it when he took his pants off last night. Is this some kind of joke? She said, starting to laugh. I don't think so, I said completely serious. Okay, so why did he take his pants off? Well, he had to take them off to get in Debbie's hot tub. Dave, that's not very funny. I told you it wasn't. Is Debbie in there? Let me talk to Debbie. Debbie doesn't live here anymore, Kathy. There was silence for a moment. Then, oh my God, oh my God. He, he didn't. Oh yes, he really did. I have to go, she whispered into the phone. Tell John I'd really like him to come by and get his wallet. I'd like to have a word with him. I said this vehemently. Without another word, she hung up. An hour later, I was dragging another trash bag of Debbie's stuff into the garage when a car pulled into the driveway. I stopped and saw Sarah get out of the car and walk over to me. She stopped, put her hands on her hips and said, She finally got you, didn't she? Yeah, I grudgingly admitted. She looked at the pile of bags I was refilling and asked, No chance? Not a chance in hell, I said firmly. She nodded in agreement. Did you come to get her stuff? I asked. No, I came to see how you were doing. Huh? said I in confusion. Oh, I'll take them with me when I leave, but I did come to see if you were really done with her. And if you did put my paddle in the water... 
I don't understand. Dave, I've been half in love with you since you started dating Debbie. When you reconciled after the breakup, I told her she better treat you right or I would. Now I think it's too soon for you to be dating your ex-sister-in-law, but I want you to know that I'm interested. Think about it. Now help me load her things into the car and I'll get them out of here. Before getting into the car, she said, By the way, Debbie is home. Dad and Mom are trying to prevent her from having a nervous breakdown. I think the fact that she was finally caught shattered her little fantasy world. I guess there really is justice in the world. She laughed, kissed me on the cheek, and left. I stared after her in utter bewilderment. I didn't know what to expect when she drove up, but certainly not this. A few days later, Katie came to get John's wallet. I turned the tape on for her and she cried. Wiping her eyes, she said, I know it wasn't the first time. I'm pretty sure he was fooling around with his previous business partner's wife a couple years ago. He suddenly went out of business and John couldn't explain why. When she left, she asked if I would make her a copy of the tape. I agreed. Carl started calling almost every day and urging Debbie and me to talk. About the fourth time, I told him not just no, but hell no, and transcribed the tape to a cassette and sent it to him. He only called once after that, and that was to apologize to me. I also sent a copy to Kathy and my attorney. I later learned that Kathy and John had separated, but were going to marriage counseling together. I never waited to list Debbie as the owner of the house. And after all, I kept records and signed for every dollar invested in it. Eventually, I agreed to give the Jeep away, as there was some doubt that it was my gift to her. A few pieces of furniture and a division of the cash in the checking and savings accounts finalized the property settlement. I think the presence of the tape discouraged Debbie and her attorney from seeking more. They certainly didn't want me to play it for the judge. I put the house up for sale as soon as I was sure it would not be considered community property. I had no desire to live in it. I had bought and remodeled it for one reason only, and that reason was gone. It was a painful reminder of a part of my life that I wanted to leave behind. It sold fairly easily, and as I expected, I made a considerable amount of money for it. Around the same time that the divorce was finalized, I got my journeyman's license. When everything worked out, I decided to go back to my dream of going back to school. An electrical engineer with an electrical certificate is always in high demand. I took a leave of absence from the auto plant and went back to college. The money I was receiving from home was more than enough to pay tuition for the three remaining semesters and basic living expenses. I continued to work for the partnership 15 to 20 hours a week. With this money and my savings, I could live comfortably. So I rented an apartment near the college I was attending. It just so happened to be the same college Sarah was attending. Coincidence? Well, maybe. They have a great engineering school. Sarah and I continued to meet up about once a week for lunch, drinks, or just to talk. She kept me in the loop on Debbie's affairs and I didn't have to ask. Carl and Angela disliked her so much that as soon as she got her Jeep back, they asked her to move out. And shortly after the divorce, she transferred to a store in suburban Detroit. Now they rarely see her. Debbie tried to get me to talk to her before and after the divorce was finalized. She relayed the message through Sarah since I refused to take her calls. I told her to tell Debbie that I was moving on with my life and there was nothing she could tell me to change. Sarah and I continue to grow closer. I recognize that there is an undeniable attraction between us. And every time we meet, she teasingly reminds me of her interest in a relationship. I've resigned myself to the idea of starting over, and she seems pretty good. She recently tokenistically suggested we move in together to save money while we both finish school. So far, I've resisted. But I think she senses I'm getting weaker. Is there a K-13 curse? If so, I think I'm definitely screwed. Thanks for watching, I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.